Was wir uns unter der deutschen Jugend der Zukunft wünschen, ist etwas anderes, als was die Vergangenheit sich gewünscht hat. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen erinnern, auf das unser Volk nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit runde geht. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth. And God created great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, and every thing that creeps upon the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help fit for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help fit for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Famed Russian author and Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote of the calamities that afflicted his people in the bloody wake of the Russian Revolution. At one point, he said, over half a century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of old people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God, they said. That's why all this has happened. Since then, I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, 
I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. In the United States, the phrase, in God we trust, adorns the back of the U.S. dollar bill. Nevertheless, controversy rages to this day about America's Christian heritage and the true intent of the Founding Fathers. But where does this debate begin? The early American colonies at Jamestown and later Plymouth came to America under the authority of King James, who authorized the King James Bible. William Bradford, who came to America on board the Mayflower to become the chief governor of the Plymouth Colony, wrote, May not the children of these fathers rightly say, Our fathers were English men, which came over this great ocean, and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice. Let them therefore praise the Lord, because he is good, and his mercies endure forever. John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, partly credited with founding the city of Boston, said, We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work which we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. The first school built in America was Harvard University in 1636, named after the Reverend John Harvard. Its original motto was, Truth for Christ and the Church. Harvard expected the following of its students. Let every scholar be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom, as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. At Princeton University, the official motto was, Under God's power she flourishes. Princeton's first president, the Reverend Jonathan Dickinson, said, Cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. While at Yale, the university's stated aim was that all scholars shall live religious, godly, and blameless lives according to the rules of God's Word, diligently reading the Holy Scriptures. Dartmouth, Columbia, William and Mary, and Brown University all had similar declarations. In fact, 123 of the first 126 colleges formed in America were formed on Christian principles. America's education system clearly represented the beliefs of some of the earliest founders and leaders. James Edward Oglethorpe established the colony of Georgia in 1732, in part as a refuge for persecuted Protestants from Europe. As the first settlers touched the shoreline, they knelt and declared, Our end in leaving our native country is not to gain riches and honor, but singly this, to live wholly for the glory of God. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, wrote, If thou wouldst rule well, thou must rule for God, and to do that thou must be ruled by him. Those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. Jonathan Trumbull, the British governor of Connecticut, who became sympathetic to the American cause in 1773, said, If you ask an American, who is his master? He will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. George Washington, on May 12, 1779, addressed the Delaware Indian chiefs who had brought their children to be educated in American schools. Washington said to them, You do well to wish to learn our arts and ways of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention. Twice appointed Secretary of State Daniel Webster said, If the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land, anarchy and misrule, degradation and misery, corruption and darkness will reign without mitigation or end. Noah Webster, whose famous Webster's Dictionary is a legacy to this day, said, No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, 
crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Samuel Adams in the Rights of the Colonists in 1772 wrote, the rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institution of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written in the New Testament. At a 4th of July celebration in 1837, President John Quincy Adams asked, why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and most venerated festival returns on this day? Is it not that in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? Is it not that the Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity? The Reverend Jedediah Morse, father of Samuel B. Morse, who developed the Morse Code, said, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoys. In proportion, as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, either through unbelief or the corruption of its doctrines, in the same proportion will the people of the nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. President Andrew Jackson concerning the Bible plainly said, that book, sir, is the rock upon which our republic rests. In 1831, a Frenchman named Alex de Tocqueville came to America to research the American prison system. He came to learn why his own country, France, had so many prisons while America had so few. In his now famous work, Democracy in America, he would later write, there is no country in the whole world in which the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. The Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to each other, but in America, I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. Yet with so many declarations about the Christian faith, history bears witness of what might be called the tares among the wheat. Plymouth Governor William Bradford wrote, Marvelous it may be to see and consider how some kind of wickedness did grow and break forth here in a land where the same was so much witnessed against. Bradford writes that in 1628, an early colony gave itself over to pagan practices, erecting a maypole, drinking and dancing about it, inviting the Indian women for their consorts, as if they had anew revived the beastly practices of the mad Bacchanalians. And of 1642, Bradford writes of the drunkenness and uncleanness, not only incontinency between persons unmarried, but some married persons also, even sodomy and buggery, things fearful to name, he says, have broke forth in this land. Yet immoral behavior was not the only concern for the early colonies. In 1637, Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop conducted the trial against Anne Marbury Hutchinson, a woman called at that time the American Jezebel. Hutchinson held meetings in her home and developed a great following. She was accused of having troubled the peace of the commonwealth and of the churches. Among her controversial teachings was that a man is united to Christ and justified without faith. At her trial, she claimed her teachings were given to her by immediate revelation. Often accused of antinomian or lawless doctrine, she said, as I understand it, laws, commands, rules, and edicts are for those who have not the light which makes plain the pathway. 
Her former mentor, the Reverend John Cotton, referred to her meetings as a promiscuous and filthy coming together of men and women, saying that her opinions would eat out the very bowels of religion. As Hutchinson's trial neared its end, she said defiantly to her judges, if you go on in this course you begin, you will bring a curse upon you and your posterity, and the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Nevertheless, Hutchinson was found guilty and expelled from the colony. Despite her threat, no record exists of any ill befalling Governor John Winthrop and those who expelled her. Yet Hutchinson's husband, William, would die four years later. And then the following year, in 1643, Anne Hutchinson herself and five of her children were savagely killed by warring Indians, an event regarded by some in Massachusetts as a manifestation of divine judgment. But after her death, Hutchinson retained a following among those who found admiration in her example of defiance. In 1850, two centuries later, Nathaniel Hawthorne refers to her as the sainted Anne Hutchinson in chapter one of his famous work, The Scarlet Letter. Some believe that Hawthorne even based the character of Hester Prynne, the adulterous woman branded with the Scarlet Letter, on Anne Hutchinson herself. While early America recognized Hutchison as the American Jezebel, she is today considered a courageous exponent of civil liberty and religious toleration. Some three and a half centuries later, Harvard University's resident preacher and professor of Christian morals, Peter Gomes, proudly boasts of her that she was, quote, deft in theological and legal sparring, intellectually superior to her accusers, and a woman of conscience who yielded to no authority. Commenting on Harvard itself, Gomes actually admits the university was originally built to protect future generations from false teachings like those of Anne Hutchinson. Gomes calls her the inadvertent midwife to a college founded in part to protect posterity from her errors. Anne Marbury Hutchison, he says, ironically, would be more at home at Harvard today than any of her critics. This twist in perception seems to symbolize the modern conflict concerning America's original intent of the word freedom. The early settlers believed it their duty to liberate themselves and mankind from the dark age of Europe. Can this be the difference between an America that once was and what she would become? A mysterious passage from Hawthorne's conclusion to his classic novel seems to embody the transformation. He writes that the scarlet letter ceased to be a stigma which attracted the world's scorn and bitterness and became a type of something to be looked upon with awe, yet with reverence too. At some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed. Is this a human being that answers my question so correctly? There was no rap. I asked, is it a spirit? If it is, make two raps. Two sounds were given as soon as the request was made. I then said, if it was an injured spirit, make two raps. I asked, were you injured in this house? I ascertained by the same method that it was a man, aged 31 years, that he had been murdered in this house and his remains were buried in the cellar. This account was given by Mrs. Margaret Fox of Hydesville, New York, concerning events that transpired on March 31st of 1848 and describes the beginning of what many consider to be the birth of modern spiritism, the communication with spirits of the dead, or beings from the other side of reality, 
While Mrs. Fox recorded the account, her daughters, Kate and Margareta, pictured here with their sister Leah, were considered the real mediums of this encounter. The sisters claimed to have contacted a disembodied spirit they called Mr. Splitfoot. The Fox sisters began a movement that exploded in the 19th century, surrounded with much controversy. The sisters became rich and famous for a time, even traveling with the likes of P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus as professional mediums. While skepticism and accusations of fraud surrounded them in their lifetime, 56 years later, on November 22, 1904, the Boston Journal would report that the skeleton of the man supposed to have caused the wrappings, first heard by the Fox sisters in 1848, had been found in the walls of the house occupied by the sisters, and clears them from the only shadow of doubt held concerning their sincerity in the discovery of spirit communication. In the aftermath of the events in Hydesville, Margareta Fox would experience further encounters. Using the alphabet to communicate, she obtained the following message from a spirit who told her, Dear friends, you must proclaim this truth to the world. This is the dawning of a new era. You must not try to conceal it any longer. When you do your duty, God will protect you, and good spirits will watch over you. At the site of the Fox Cottage at 1510 Hydesville Road, a monument was erected that said, the birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox sisters, through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established, March 31st, 1848. The monument went on to say, there is no death, there are no dead. Placed here December 5th, 1927. A Masonic obelisk in Rochester, New York further commemorates the event, but investigators continue to question exactly what the sisters encountered. The mysterious name given to their spirit, Mr. Splitfoot, is considered by some to be an old world reference to the adversary of mankind, the devil. In the wake of the Fox sisters' encounter, a man named Phineas Quimby opened an office dedicated to spiritually aided healing in 1859. Quimby is considered the father of the New Thought movement, believed to be the forerunner of what is today called the New Age. Quimby developed a process of healing through altered states of consciousness, achieved primarily through hypnosis. He believed that a person's illness was the result of their spiritual beliefs, Therefore, by getting rid of a person's old belief and introducing them to new thought, he could, supposedly, heal them. His followers write that, in treating his patients, Dr. Quimby allowed his mind for a while to be passive, and in this way he was affected by the troubled mind of his patient and so could feel his aches and pains. Then because his spiritual senses were freed from his own beliefs, they were acted upon and controlled by a higher intelligence. Through what he learned in his sessions, Dr. Quimby began to abandon his traditional beliefs in favor of what the higher intelligence revealed. The New Thought magazine reported that Dr. Quimby believed Jesus of Nazareth was the one person who taught this science. He said, I have no doubt of his being the only true prophet who had ideas entirely superior to the world. Not that he as a man was any better, but he was the embodiment of a higher wisdom. One of Quimby's patients was Mary Baker Eddy, who would go on to form the Church of Christ Scientist in 1879, based in part upon Quimby's teachings. The young Mary Baker imagined Quimby to possess an understanding of God's law and was ready to proclaim him as the discoverer of the true nature of the healing done in Bible times. Though Eddie would break away from Quimby, she continued his practice of healing by correcting the so-called errors of traditional beliefs. She claimed that her teachings were based solely upon the Bible, but that the Bible was full of mistakes and she was the one to correct them. It is reported that, 
Eddie believed the Bible contained 30,000 errors in the Old Testament and 300,000 in the New Testament. When she published her work, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, she claimed it was the final revelation of God to mankind and asserted that her work was inspired of God. The word key in the title of her book is in reference that she is the key to unlocking the Bible, which she called a dark book, and that her writings provided the key spoken of in Revelation 3.7. Therefore, as the key, Eddie sought to explain certain misunderstandings. For example, the Bible says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Yet Eddie is criticized for teaching that prayer for the sick is not what will lead to one's healing. Only enlightened understanding heals. Eddie wrote specifically that the common custom of praying for the recovery of the sick finds help in blind belief, whereas help should come from the enlightened understanding. Among other problems were the issues of sin and death. Eddie taught that these things were only illusions and that a person must overcome them by realizing their unreality. Meanwhile, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Furthermore, the scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But Mary Baker Eddy taught that there is no sin, and the belief in sin, which has grown terrible in strength and influence, is an unconscious error. Concerning the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, she taught that the material blood of Jesus was no more efficacious to cleanse from sin when it was shed upon the accursed tree than when it was flowing in his veins as he went daily about his father's business. Eddie next sought to deny death itself by redefining the resurrection of Christ with shadowy language that seems to foretell the new age. She said, the final demonstration of the truth which Jesus taught and for which he was crucified opened a new era for the world. The lonely precincts of the tomb gave Jesus a refuge from his foes, a place in which to solve the great problem of being. His three days work in the sepulcher set the seal of eternity on time. He proved life to be deathless. Eddie's views concerning Jesus seem to echo the same conclusion wrought as a result of the Fox sisters' spiritual encounter, the idea that there is no death and there are no dead. Researcher Gary Hand sums up Eddie's views concerning Jesus, saying she taught that Jesus Christ was just a man who overcame death by realizing that it did not exist. Therefore, he did not rise from the dead because he never died. Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, did not come from God, but is only an idea from the infinite mind, i.e. the principle of God. Eddie said that Jesus demonstrated the power of Christian science to heal mortal minds and bodies, but this power was lost sight of and must again be spiritually discerned. This desire to generate healing through spiritual means had great momentum in the 19th century. In 1848, supposedly the same day the Fox sisters communicated with the dead, a man named Andrew Jackson Davis wrote in his diary saying, About daylight this morning, a warm breathing passed over my face, and I heard a voice, tender and strong, say, Brother, the good work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. Like Phineas Quimby and later Edgar Cayce in the 20th century, Andrew Jackson Davis performed medical diagnosis and healing while in a mesmerized, trance-like state, making use of what he called the spirit eyes in his forehead. He would be known as the John the Baptist of modern spiritualism and the prophet of the new revelation. In 1844, Davis claimed to be swept away from his home in Poughkeepsie, 40 miles away to the Catskill Mountains, where he encountered the long-dead spirits of the Greek philosopher Galen and the Swedish seer Emanuel Swedenborg. 
Galen gave Davis a magical staff of healing, while Swedenborg promised to instruct and guide him. Thereafter, Davis considered himself personally guided in his steps by the Swedish mystic. As a result, Andrew Jackson Davis's teachings were nearly identical to those of Swedenborg. Swedenborg, sometimes known as the man who talked with angels, was a spiritual medium who died in 1771, best known for his unbiblical concepts of heaven and hell. In his lifetime, he wrote many books on his experiences, though he said that the books were not written by himself. Rather, he claimed they were inspired by spirits and angels from the spirit world. These spirits repeatedly told Swedenborg of the errors of traditional church doctrine. As a result, he would argue against the idea of a triune God, and like Mary Baker Eddy, vehemently rejected the concept of Christian atonement and original sin. Swedenborg's rejection of Christ's atonement on the cross was so extreme that he wrote, This I can affirm, that whenever the angels hear anyone say that God determined the damnation of the human race, and as an enemy was reconciled by his son, they are affected in a manner similar to those who from an uneasiness in their bowels and stomach are excited to vomiting, on which occasion they say, what can be more insane than to affirm such things to God? According to his followers, Swedenborg's teachings declare that there is no such thing as eternal punishment, and that those who find themselves in hell after death can work their way towards something higher. Yet Swedenborg himself warned against the revelations of the very spirits he communed with. In his miscellaneous theological works, he wrote, Spirits narrate things wholly false and lie. When spirits begin to speak to man, care should be taken not to believe them, for most everything they say is made up by them, and they lie. And if man listens and believes, they insist and in various ways deceive and seduce. Despite such contradiction, Swedenborg's influence has been great, impacting churches and with them the ancient orders of Freemasonry. Many Masonic lodges throughout Europe became known as Swedenborgian lodges, and the rite of Swedenborg became part of Masonic ritual. Today, Emanuel Swedenborg is hailed as a hero among spiritists and liberal Christians who have even established Swedenborgian churches, such as the Church of the New Jerusalem, dedicated to his teachings. Perhaps most significant is Swedenborg's example of setting down spirit-communicated writings, something that would set a pattern repeated well into the 20th century and practiced by nearly every major leader of what would become the New Age movement. While Swedenborg channeled many spirits, years after his death, Andrew Jackson Davis would claim to channel him. Supposedly, whilst in a trance, Davis acted as the medium through whom Swedenborg was able to resume his work by dictating various philosophical books, in one of which, published in 1847, he predicted the advent of spiritualism. From 1845 to 1847, Davis delivered some 157 lectures while in a trance-like state in New York City on scientific, historical, and philosophical topics. Reportedly famed macabre author Edgar Allan Poe even attended some of Davis's seances. In what is considered his greatest work, The Principles of Nature, Her Divine Revelations and Voice to Mankind, Andrew Jackson Davis described a mystic view of the cosmos and of creation, promoting the theology of universalism. Some modern spiritists believe Davis's writings shadowed the evolutionary thinking that would soon be set down by Charles Darwin. Darwin's theory of evolution, perhaps the climax of a movement aimed at establishing new thought in the minds of men, would, for many, remove the fear of an almighty creator and widen the gate into the realm of the unknown. Through the 19th and 20th centuries, Western culture has been overwhelmed by a fascination with spirit communication and paranormal phenomenon. 
Some of the most influential people in the modern era have been influenced themselves by New Age Spiritism and the occult. From Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln, who held seances in the White House to communicate with her son Willie, who had died at a young age, to Hillary Rodham Clinton, who supposedly contacted the ghost of Eleanor Roosevelt with New Age psychic Jean Dixon. Hillary is pictured here submitting herself to the power of an American Indian shaman. Inventors, heroes, dictators, world leaders, and even American presidents have been either influenced by or directly involved with the movement. Thomas Edison spent years trying to develop a machine that could communicate with spirits of the dead. While his efforts were unsuccessful, Edison was convinced that one day such an invention would be possible. Chester Carlson, the inventor of the now famous Xerox photocopying process, reportedly received the inspiration for his invention from the spirit world. Carl Gustav Jung, whose teachings on the subconscious mind have had a tremendous influence on modern psychology, claimed to be guided by a mysterious spirit named Philemon. Jung's contemporary Sigmund Freud said that it no longer seems possible to brush aside the study of so-called occult facts, the real existence of psychic forces in which, until now, we did not believe. Commenting on his own experiences with powers unknown, Dr. Andrea Puharic wrote, I am personally convinced that superior beings from other spaces and other times have initiated a renewed dialogue with humanity. While I do not doubt their existence, he said, I do not know what their goals are with respect to humankind. Some argue that the goals of these beings were partly witnessed during the Second World War. Adolf Hitler was greatly influenced by spiritual forces, an influence that seemed to shape his horrific Nazi movement. French intellectual Denis de Rogmont once described his experience at a Nazi rally in 1938. De Rogman indicated that despite his rigorous attempt to remain detached from the spectacle unfolding before him, he was involuntarily drawn into the vortex of the crowd's hysterical adulation of Adolf Hitler. It was only by dint of a kind of superhuman resolve, said the French philosopher, that he was able to regain his equilibrium before the mesmerizing presence of Hitler's evil genius. Reportedly, de Rogman said of Hitler that some people believe from having experienced in his presence a feeling of horror and an impression of supernatural power that he is the seat of thrones, dominions and powers by which St. Paul meant those hierarchical spirits which can descend into any ordinary mortal and occupy him like a garrison. What I am saying would be the cheapest form of romantic nonsense were it not that what has been established by this man, or rather through him, is a reality that is one of the wonders of the century. Hitler's training as a spiritual mystic came through a secret order known as the Tool Society, an occult organization. Though the cause of such societies may vary, the same occult principles can be found in the Brotherhood of the Masonic Orders, whose members have included some of the most powerful political leaders of the 20th century. To test this argument, consider Hitler's dream of the Superman, alongside this quote from Masonic author W. L. Wilmhurst from his book, The Meaning of Masonry. He writes, this, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, the religion of masonry. Man who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a god-like being. Wilmhurst provides a clue revealing that while the modern spiritist movement is often referred to as a new discovery, its origins date back centuries, 
to the subterranean levels of the ancient world, to a time when spirit communication was considered commonplace among men and was at the very heart of the ancient mystery religion. But with this ancient practice also comes ancient warnings found in the writings of the Old Testament. Author Dave Hunt comments on the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 8, 20. Why do you turn to spirits that peep and mutter, these wizards, the spirits of the dead? I mean, Aunt Jane wasn't too bright when she was alive, but now that she's on the other side, she seems to be a fountainhead of wisdom. Uh, that doesn't make too much sense. Where did she get this from, and how do you know you're even talking to Aunt Jane? Uh, some of them claim, you know, they've all got their spirit guides or whatever, uh, and uh, they don't know who these creatures are that are talking to them and through them. Uh, you go to a, a, a psychic, a medium, and, uh, for example, uh, Bishop James Pike, California Episcopalian bishop, went to a medium. Well, he was, his son had committed suicide, and he was in his son's apartment in uh, London. And some things would move around. He'd come back from being out, and, and there's some postcards in a certain pattern, and, and, and with messages and so forth. And he began to think that his son, Jim Jr., was trying to communicate with him. So he went to Anna Twig, a famous psychic there in London. And what do you know? She goes into a trance. And, uh, you know, the prophets in the Bible don't go into a trance. They don't get into an altered state and then something takes over. God speaks to them. Uh, never do they do that. But anyway, she goes into a trance and, wow, it sounds like his son's voice, Jim Jr., speaking through her. And he says things that only he and his son would know. She couldn't possibly know. Uh, this has happened multiple times. Uh, so that convinces him it must really be his son. Yeah, but what does his son say? You see, we. We go by what, in part, there are many ways of analyzing them, but in part we go by what do they say? Well, first thing his son Jim says, Dad, I'm not here for a pleasant afternoon's conversation. I have a mission now. Uh, I want you to know that God isn't personal. He's a force. And Jesus is not the Savior. I mean, he's just a more highly evolved uh, being than I am. I've heard about him. I haven't seen him yet, but he's on a higher plane. Uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, spirit survival. No, Dad, there's no judgment. Uh, God doesn't judge you. You don't face him in judgment. We just move into graduate school and we continue to learn our lessons, you know, and progress and so forth. All of the lies undermining what the Bible says. But the Bible is the book that has true prophecies, no false prophecies. You can't escape it. It's true, okay? So when these entities begin to uh, disagree with the Bible and undermine the Bible, I know who they are. In fact, uh, you know, I've interviewed people around the world, I've been studying this thing for years, uh, whether they're channelers, you got about a thousand of them in Los Angeles, you used to have, I don't know how many they have now. Or read some of your New Age publications, they will admit that what the channelers, what the psychics, what the mediums say, all over the world who've never been in touch with one another, there's a continuity to it. There's an amazing uh, uh, similarity, not just a similarity, but it's it really, it's coming from the same source, obviously. And there's a definite philosophy that is presented that conforms to the four lies that the serpent introduced to even the Garden of Eden that God is not personal but a force, that you don't die. There's no death, you just get recycled. Reincarnation. And we're moving upward, we're evolving upward to Godhood. You can become a God, that's the lie of the serpent. And the fourth one, nothing wrong with you, it's the way you think, you need to be initiated into this knowledge, the tree of knowledge, with a dark and a light side, you know, the Star Wars force and so forth. They all say that. It's consistent. Well, that tells me who's behind it. This is the same thing that Satan said through the serpent to Eve in the garden. So I don't regard these people uh, with any respect. Unfortunately, and some of them may be sincere, 
they have sold out to Satan because they've rejected the true God, they've rejected the Word of God. I mean, when I consider what the Bible tells me and the prophecies it gives me, and the proof, for example, that Jesus is the Messiah, all that it says, centuries, thousands of years, in fact, some of them, before he came, where he would be born, even the day he would ride into Jerusalem and so forth. I mean, you cannot escape it. This is the truth. Now, anybody who then turns from this book, and we've got uh, some sincere people that I think may be real Christians in, in, the, in the charismatic world, and I'm not against uh, uh, someone believing in the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Bible is not enough for them. You know, they, if God would only give them orders every morning and neon sign across the sky, or if they could hear a voice, you know, and I, some of these people, I'd talk to them, and they oh, Dave, let me tell you what the Lord just told me about you. Really? Well, the Lord hasn't told me. And I'll check you out against the Bible, you know, and I'm not interested. But you say, why do people get involved in this? They want to know the future. They want to know what's going to happen to them. I mean, if you knew what was going to happen to you, what would you do? Uh, you, <clears throat> you're going to have a wreck? Are you going to try to avoid that street? Or I mean, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. But they want somehow to get some power, some control over their lives, and they're very curious what's going to happen. Well, they're going to the wrong source to find out what's going to happen, and it has brought disaster. <laughs> I've written books about it, brought disaster into many lives. Spirit channelers and mediums from all walks of life claim contact with the spirit realm. The purpose of this contact, supposedly, is to teach mankind to achieve a higher state of consciousness through the knowledge they present. A classic example is Jay-Z Knight, a highly successful spirit channeler who channels a spirit calling itself Ramtha. Ramtha's School of Enlightenment claims to reach some 60 cities in 26 countries around the world. In this interview, shot in 1998, Knight explains how she came in contact with her guiding spirit. This was like an angel in my kitchen. You, do, you don't have time to react. You don't have time to, to, to rationalize this in your life. This is happening in your little kitchen. You just, I just blurted out, you're so beautiful, who are you? And he smiled, this beautiful smile lit up the whole room, and he said, I am Ramtha the Enlightened One, and I've come to help you over the ditch. And I looked back up at him, <laughs> and he said, Beloved daughter, he said, I have come to make you a light to the world. Equipped with a bad British accent, something that seems common among channelers, Knight gives herself over to the spirit of Ramtha. I am Ramtha the Enlightened One. I am 35,362, 1 and 37 seconds years old. I was born in that which is termed a great and marvelous place called Muria. And my destiny here is to teach you that which you desire to know. And to let you know that every word that I say I will manifest for you in your life. Incredibly, throughout the interview, Ramtha and Knight repeat the central themes of the New Age movement over and over, insisting that there is no death and that man himself is a god, his only task being to realize his self-empowerment. So I must become the teacher. I must plant in your mind outrageous concepts. Here, Knight denies that Ramtha is a demon, but believes he was a man who has achieved divine status due to knowledge and experience. He's not a devil. He's not a demon. He's not a guru. He's a god. I am a teacher and a god. I'm a god because I experienced all of these things. And I am a teacher, not of truth, but of philosophy. Ramtha insists that his teaching is simple, to get people to realize the great intelligence within themselves and that they can do no wrong. It's really simple. First, you have to acknowledge 
that you are the great intelligence and it lives in you. And your body is an extension of that intelligence. And there is no good and bad in God. That's impossible. As if echoing the voice of the serpent, Knight now directs the listener to the path to of sacred day. knowledge. We deserve to know the truth. And those who ask are going to be given everything, going to be given all the sacred knowledge. We are not given but one lifetime to prove what we know. This is not a test. It is an opportunity. Ramtha propagates the New Age lie that man has many opportunities to get it right through reincarnation and evolution. Years ago, I would say that I'm relatively young to many of you who have been reincarnating and slowly evolving to ask the great questions, the great mysteries, to have them revealed here. My daughter is here simply to say, you're an immortal. You are wearing this body as if you wore a garment of silk or a garment of roughly hewn wool. You are here simply to wear the garment and to live the experience, but you have never died and never will. That is not in the plan of God. Next, Knight and Ramtha deny that God is a person, but insist he is a natural life force that exists in everyone. He saw what God really is. God is not a being. It is life itself. It's, it's the will of life, and it's in everything. You want to help people, and you have to live your light, and you have to be proud that you accept if God lives, he is in me, and you are a righteous man for saying so, because if he lives in you, then he lives in everyone. Why cannot everyone share such a treasure? I love his message, behold God. I love it that he says to us that we are divine, the journey of awakening is not through a redeemer, but when we realize we are our own redeemer. It is a lie, it is a lie, what the fanatics tell you. As with the rest of the movement, rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the church is essential to the message. As long as we think that some channel, some channeled entity, some Christ, some priest, some preacher, some deity, some prophet is our redeemer that excuses us from living life. We have missed the message. Why don't we learn to think on our own and find new benefactors for that greatness? Genius, you know, it is that which is not mediocrity is not predictable, is not funded, is not hired. It is that which can dream beyond the paradigms. You have the ability to be a genius. And did you know that every dream that you dream should never be put aside as imagination? That every dream is the next step of your evolution. And Ramtha gives us permission. He first says, you are God. Now let's get about learning how to be that. Religion is no longer sacred. Everyone questions the church. They should. Everyone questions the meaning of life, and everyone questions the direction that science has taken. And when you do that, it is an age of enlightenment. We cannot have. Enlightenment does not come on the heels of the Black Plague. No, that is not enlightenment. Enlightenment comes on the heels of plenty. Because only when you are gluttonous to everything and you question everything are you ripe to know what you have never known. So forget about the past and live today on the wisdom, the virtue of what you've gained. You don't have to feel guilty about your life anymore. I would love someone to stand up and say, God doesn't live outside of you. God is you. While Jay-Z Knight is among the more successful mediums, she is certainly not alone. 
a nearly identical doctrine is preached from a series of channelers who believe they are in communication with extraterrestrial spirits from other planets and galaxies. In the documentary, UFOs and Channeling, the late actor Telly Savalas reveals that the purpose of channeling these alien entities is entirely consistent with the purpose of the New Thought New Age movement, to change the thinking of mankind. Tonight, we're going to show you some film that may change the way you think about life. Change the way you think about life. Next, we are introduced to a woman who channels a spirit, calling itself Leah. Hello, Philip. How are you today? Very good, Leah. How are you? Very fine, thank you. So, what is it that you wanted to know? Where are you from? I'm from Venus. I don't think anybody's going to believe that uh, you or anybody else could be from Venus. Could you explain to us how you could be when everybody knows it's uninhabitable? They think it's uninhabitable because it is not inhabitable by physical life forms. We have bodies of light. While Leah rambles on with fantastical ideas, she soon compels the audience toward global unity, a message found throughout the New Age movement. And what occurs here on this planet will affect the rest of the universe. Can you, with all of your different ideas, all of your different races, come together as one planet and one people? We have dedicated millennia upon millennia to this idea. The earlier experiments with Pan and Lemuria and Atlantis were not successful. But this one will be. Now the interviewer asks the woman to exchange spirits and to channel another spirit that calls itself the Tibetan. Tibet is an often referred to hotspot for New Age empowerment. Hitler's Nazi occultists went to Tibet thinking to find their ancient Aryan ancestors. Listen carefully to the Tibetan's message as he refers to the great I Am, the name God reveals in the Bible to describe himself. I am the Tibetan and I have come during this time continuum to discuss with you the idea of the only question in the universe. And that question is, what is? And the answer is, I am. For all things that are created, that were created, that shall be created, fall under the question, what is? And you, each and every one of you, are that answer, and that answer is, I am. I am is also the name of the creator of this universe. That is all. I relinquish control to the entity, Leah. As the entity Leah returns, she confirms the You Are God message and refers to the new race that will arise through the New Age movement. Most New Agers today do not realize that this new race is identical to the master race prophesied by Adolf Hitler, a race of so-called supermen who will be their own gods, having rejected the one true God of the Bible. This new age is where there will be a race on this planet and throughout all galaxies. And the name of that race will be peace. It's been wonderful spending some time with you. As you take this little piece of information with you, know that you are never alone. You are all connected to the creative source of this universe. And nothing can stop that flow except your denial that you are God. We thank you. Good day. This man channels a spirit calling itself Bashar, 
who seems to hold his audience spellbound as he tells them they are equal to the creator of the universe. That you are all made in the image of the infinite creator, and what that means is you are all infinite creators. We thank you. Jack Purcell has become one of the more popular channels possessed by a spirit named Lazarus. Ooh, right, fine. <clears throat> well, indeed, a pleasure to be talking with you, and, uh, well, shall we begin where you'd like to begin? Lazarus tells the listener that God is already within man, and that if man wants to find God, he needs only to find himself. Now, the problem here is people look out there, yes? They're looking all over the place as though God were somehow outside of them. It's within. Every spiritual reference, be it fundamental or be it avant-garde, speaks of that spirit within. And we would suggest here that it's there. And therefore, your task in this physical lifetime really isn't to find God, because God's everywhere. <laughs> God, God is all that is, is everything. It's all over the place. Your task in any physical incarnation is to find yourself. Jane Roberts was a New Age pioneer who channeled a spirit known as Seth. Roberts sold more than a million copies of her books and inspired many. In this vocal recording, we hear her channel the spirit of Seth. I've said this many times. I say it a million times. Here in this class and in my books, you form your reality. Then what is the you that forms this spectacular reality that you know? When will you be willing to admit the greatness that is within each of you and not Power. And not say in this realm of reality it is not possible, but uh, encounter the greatness within yourselves. Clearly the main message that Seth is trying to say is that people are gods in training. Some may find it interesting that the name Seth is synonymous with the Egyptian god, Set. And in the realm of the occult, Set is one of the infernal names of Satan. Actress Shirley MacLaine was Time Magazine's poster girl for the New Age movement in the 1980s. MacLaine starred in the biographical miniseries Out on a Limb, based on her journey into New Age belief. The series has been called the most talked about miniseries of all time. The title, Out on a Limb, refers to the risk involved in seeking the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Mayan told me to tell you one thing if you had a hard time with this. She said in order to get to the fruit of the tree, you have to go out on a limb. Mayan is a spirit guide sending a message to McLean, a message that is repeated throughout the series. In this scene, McLean and her New Age mentor declare themselves to be God. I am 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 I God. Am God. I, am I am God. God. I, am I am God. God. I am God. Author and filmmaker Carol Matriciana exposed the God men of India's Hindu religion in the documentary named after her book, Gods of the New Age, where even the most unlikely Western disciples praised mere men as gods. If anyone could be near the beloved master and witness the love, the compassion, the humility, the grace, the generosity, no one in his right mind would not know that this is a walking, talking, living God on earth. Now the one thing with the New Age which is very interesting, you see if we start going on to a concept of that is any one group more important than the other, no it isn't. Two decades ago when I made the film Gods of the New Age, uh, the New Age Directory had over 10,000 networking organizations that were all working together. And if any one of them became an embarrassment to them, as Jim Jones, who was of the People's Temple, who killed, who had hundreds of his followers commit suicide, he was part of this New Age directory. 
working towards a super race and trying to work through becoming better through human potential um, techniques, etc., etc. Uh, but when he was an embarrassment, he was, in a sense, removed out of this whole concept of New Age networking. Jim Jones, who claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, was in fact seduced by the lie of the serpent. I'm a god and you're a god. And I'm a god and I'm going to stay a god until you recognize that you're a god. And when you recognize you're a god, I shall go back into principle and will not appear as a personality. You are god. But until I see all of you knowing who you are, I'm going to be very much what I am. God Almighty God! David Koresh, leader of the Branch Davidian movement, whose followers were tragically killed in a fiery blaze in Waco, Texas, was likewise led astray by Satan's delusion. I'm God. I'm God. Great concern has been expressed by researchers who have witnessed this doctrine creeping into professing Christian churches, among teachers like Kenneth Copeland. Copeland has said, man was created in the God class. We are a class of gods. God himself spawned us from his innermost being. Listen now as Copeland compares himself to the I am of the Bible. When I read in the Bible where he says I am, I just smile and say yes, I am too. In a conversation with Copeland, TBN founder Paul Crouch espouses the same doctrine. You know what else that's settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, that we're gods. I am a little god. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation with him. Yeah. I am a little god. You are a little god, declare Copeland and Benny Hinn on TBN. I am a little God, exalts Paul Crouch on international television and condemns to hell the heresy hunters who say this teaching isn't biblical. Get out of God's way. Quit blocking God's bridges. For God's going to shoot you if I don't. But the serpent's lie seems to have no denominational boundaries. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Son of God became man so that we might become God, the only begotten Son of God wanting to make us sharers in His divinity, assumed our nature, so that He might make men gods. Pope John Paul II has said, man is called to cooperate with God in his salvation and divinization. The divinization of man comes from God. The Mormon Church is no stranger to this doctrine. Latter-day Mormon prophet Spencer W. Kimball has said, in each of us is the potentiality to become a god. Man can transform himself. He has in him the seeds of godhood that can grow. Perhaps most chilling of all is this quote from Colonel Michael Aquino, former member of the Church of Satan, who began his own satanic church called the Temple of Set. Aquino declared on the Oprah Winfrey show, we are not servants of some god, we are our own gods. In his book, The Fellowship, New Age adherent Brad Steiger writes that many are convinced that the Aquarian Age is heralding in a new religion. Even the word religion will not be used anymore for the main crux of the matter will have a much deeper sense of reality. The person will evolve out of believing in something into becoming something. The person will know what the religions of the ancient age have always tried to demonstrate, to be still and know that you are God. Indeed, this is the great new religion. Each and every person will know that he is God. The Bible does not support the idea that man is God or that he will ever become a God. In the Bible, God says, understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. While the New Age declares that God is in everyone and everything, the Bible says repeatedly that God is holy. The word holy means separate. 
In other words, while God created everything, he is separate from his creation. The Apostle Paul warned that in the last days, because men received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. While the New Age teaches self-reliance, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. In the Bible, God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. He says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The psalmist writes, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In the Old Testament, the story of King Saul serves as a warning to those who would seek the counsel of the dead or of spirit mediums rather than God. Saul had disobeyed the things God commanded him to do, but soon trouble came upon him and he encountered a great host of his enemies, the Philistines. The Bible says that he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. At first he sought counsel from God, but when the Lord did not answer him right away, rather than wait, he chose to consult a medium known as the Witch of Endor. Saul asked her to call up the ghost of the prophet Samuel, who had died some time before. The spirit of Samuel then appeared, only to prophesy of Saul's impending defeat and death for his disobedience. Saul was delivered into the hands of his enemies and slain the following day. The scripture says specifically that Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of a medium to inquire of her and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him. Despite this warning, 3,000 years later, a modern website actually welcomes people to the Witch of Endor homepage, inviting them to ask questions of the dead, just like King Saul did in biblical days. This is your opportunity, it says. Sadly, this website fails to warn its viewers against the judgment of God. The Word of God says concerning the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. God warns that sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire, and that those who practice witchcraft shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In the book of Isaiah, God says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living, should they seek unto the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul warned the church when he wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. It would seem the seducing spirits of the 18th and 19th centuries focus first on creating a new mentality in the minds of men concerning the traditional interpretation of the Bible. But as the movement progressed, the attack would reach to the very heart of God's authority.
When spiritist prophet Andrew Jackson Davis channeled his book on the principles of nature, he claimed to be a voice to mankind to set forth the divine revelations of nature itself. He declared that in the beginning, the universalum was one boundless, undefinable, and unimaginable ocean of liquid fire, and that through an evolving process, all things proceeded from this principle of power. Like Mary Baker Eddy, Davis taught that God was not a person who created things according to his will, but rather was a principle or force that could be tapped into. Describing the laws of man and nature, he said, would it not be best to have the world exist on these immutable laws? Then existence would be emblematical of the brightness and beauty of Eden. Then the great tree, which has so long been concealed from the mental view, would grow and progress in glory, beauty, and perfection. Its branches would wave over the world. Such would be the delicious fruits of the great tree of knowledge. Rather than recognize the tree of knowledge as a curse upon mankind, Davis sought to embrace it. And rather than allow God's word to define how we understand nature, Davis suggested that man's understanding of nature should govern his comprehension of God. Davis wrote, it is the office of paleontological sciences to set forth general truths in the departments of astronomy, geology, anatomy, physiology, etc., all as in perfect harmony with each other. In this, true theology has its foundation, and the teachings of this should constitute the only study of the theologian. As such, it is compelling that men of science would become the oracles for the next stage in the new thought process. In 1859, Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species. Most students today, while familiar with Darwin, are unaware of the full title of his work, which is The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. In this work, Darwin challenged the origin of animal life on the planet and formalized the evolutionary ideas that had been pondered for centuries. In 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man, in which he applied this thinking to the origin of mankind itself. More than a century later, Charles Darwin is revered as a prophetic voice for humanism in the scientific community. His theories on evolution are today regarded as scientific fact. The very authorship of life itself, once acknowledged as from a divine creator who made man in his own image, has now been attributed to chance and the coincidence of nature. Yet some researchers argue that Darwin's theory has no foundation in real science, but is rather based on the ancient mystery teachings of the occult. First, I would say uh, the evolution theory did not start with Charles Darwin. It started way before that. It actually started in the Garden of Eden with Satan when he said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. The whole idea that man can progress and evolve and become better, you know, is an idea that came from the devil in the Garden of Eden. Um, Satan started that. And then down through history, there have been who knows how many thousands of folks that have promoted that idea or pushed it. Aristotle taught a form of evolution. Plato taught a type of evolution. Uh, the Babylonians, I mean, down through history, there's always been folks who taught, you know, that we, uh, the Egyptians uh, taught we evolved from slime along the Nile River. Um, so Darwin simply made the theory popular. That's all he did. He didn't really... Um, uh, invent the theory of evolution. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, wrote a whole book called Zoonomia, where he basically laid out everything Darwin said. And Darwin, his grandson, then stole all of his ideas and never gave credit to Grandpa one time. Uh, interesting plagiarism back then. But uh, Darwin's theory, uh, as we call it Darwin's theory, but actually it was way before him, the evolution theory would say that uh, everything is evolving and getting better, and we don't see any of that. You know, we don't see any mutations produce any improvement to the gene pool. Uh, mutation is a scrambling of information that uh, results in a genetic loss. Uh, 
nobody's ever proven a good mutation. Some people say, well, bacteria become resistant to drugs. I say, well, yeah, that's because they lost information. The antibiotic can't lock onto the ribosome. <laughs> so that's, it's like uh, you go, somebody's coming through town and they're handcuffing everybody, hauling them off to jail, going to kill them. But you don't have any arms, so they can't handcuff you. You say, wow, that's beneficial. Well, it might be beneficial for the moment, but it's not beneficial in the long term, okay? So these bacteria that are deformed, that have lost information, now are um, able to be resistant to the drugs only be for that particular drug and only for a short time. When you put them back in the regular population, they're, they're, not, they're worse off. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever to back up the evolution theory. Nobody's ever seen a dog come from a non-dog, and we certainly have never seen a dog come from a rock, which is what the evolution theory teaches if you go back, you know, millions of years. Um, most evolutionists don't even know their own theory. They don't even know that they believe they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. A typical modern science textbook says that 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. For some unknown reason, this region exploded. This explosion is called the Big Bang. Coming out of this Big Bang, a giant rock somehow appeared that was rained on by cosmic rains for millions of years. Evolutionary scientists teach that from this rock, supposedly, came all the life on planet Earth. So the evolution theory teaches, you know, 20 billion years ago or sometime in the past, you know, pick a number, nothing exploded and made everything. And then uh, all this stuff was spreading out through space from the Big Bang theory, and then slowly uh, groups of this matter began to get together and condense into planets and stars and, you know, moons and stuff like that. And then slowly, slowly, very slowly, over billions of years, or quickly if you're from Harvard, uh, one of those planets, Earth, started to develop life, just by chance, of course, took, took a long time. And then that first life form that slowly evolved out of the uh, soup in the ocean uh, learned how to reproduce itself, which is a pretty good trick, of course, and then slowly it turned into different kinds of animals. So elephants and bananas and humans have a common ancestor by the evolution theory. That is pure speculation. It's religious. They believe that. I don't care what they believe, but it's not science. Darwinian scientists have attempted to explain the process of evolution as a gradual development that takes place over millions of years. Yet some scientists argue that for the building blocks of life, this is simply impossible. Darwin himself admitted that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Through the 20th century, the complexity of living organisms has revealed itself to be far greater than Darwin ever imagined. At the White House Millennium Council for the year 2000, world-renowned scientist Stephen Hawking commented that our present computers are less complex than the brain of an earthworm, a species not noted for their intellectual powers. Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling taught that a single cell, the smallest living unit, is more complicated than New York City. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, author and biochemist Michael J. Behe argues that the complexity of cell structure overthrows the idea of a gradual evolution. His conclusions reveal that highly sophisticated molecular machines control every cellular process. Thus, the details of life are finely calibrated, and the machinery of life enormously complex. Behe writes that the simplest self-sufficient cell has the capacity to produce thousands of different proteins and other molecules. Synthesis, degradation, energy generation, replication, maintenance of cell architecture, mobility, regulation, repair, communication, all of these functions take place in virtually every cell. And each function itself requires the interaction of numerous parts. A child can die because of a single defect in one of the many machines needed for taking proteins to the lysosome. A single flaw in the cell's protein transport pathway is fatal. 
Unless the entire system were immediately in place, our ancestors would have died. He concludes that attempts at a gradual evolution are a recipe for extinction. Behe further rebukes the scientific community for ignoring the evidence. He says the impotence of Darwinian theory in accounting for the molecular basis of life is evident from the complete absence in the professional scientific literature of any detailed models by which complex biochemical systems could have been produced. In the 20th century, other noteworthy scientists have agreed. World-renowned astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle rejected Darwin's theory. It was Hoyle who coined the phrase, the Big Bang. He was, in fact, mocking the idea that all things came about through some great explosion billions of years ago. Hoyle calculated that the odds of producing just the basic enzymes of life by chance are one in one with 40,000 zeros after it. Hoyle claims that believing the first cell originated by chance is like believing a tornado could sweep through a junkyard filled with airplane parts and form a Boeing 747. He said, the scientific world has been bamboozled into believing that evolution has been proved. Nothing could be further from the truth. Hoyle said this situation is well known to geneticists and yet nobody seems to blow the whistle decisively on the theory. Most scientists still cling to Darwinism because of its grip on the educational system. You either have to believe the concepts or be branded a heretic. Australian biologist Michael Denton, author of the book Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, says science has so thoroughly discredited Darwinian evolution that it should be discarded. Meanwhile, mathematics professor Wolfgang Smith says evolution is a metaphysical myth, totally bereft of scientific sanction. At the British Museum of Natural History in London, paleontologist Colin Patterson started asking other scientists to tell him one thing they knew about evolution. Lecturing to biologists at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, he said, I tried that question on the geology staff at the Field Museum of Natural History, and the only answer I got was silence. I tried it on the members of the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar in the University of Chicago, a very prestigious body of evolutionists, and all I got there was silence for a long time, and eventually one person said, I do know one thing, it ought not to be taught in high school. In spite of the evidence, Patterson did not abandon evolution. He says, then I woke up and realized that all my life I had been duped into taking evolutionism as revealed truth in some way. He said he had experienced a shift from evolution as knowledge to evolution as faith. What Patterson described was his own paradigm shift from scientist to Darwinian worshiper, his idol, the cathedral of evolutionary thought. This trend among scientists has been acknowledged by others in the scientific community. The building behind me is London's Natural History Museum. It looks rather like a cathedral or a church, and in a way that's what it is. It's a kind of temple to Darwin's theory of evolution. People come to museums like the Natural History Museum to get answers to their question, have we evolved from apes? Do humans and apes share a common ancestor? And to look at an exhibit like this, you'd think that question had been answered decisively yes. But the answer is far from decisive. In fact, this representation is an interpretation of the fossils, the interpretation of one group of scientists. There are other interpretations, but you won't find them in this museum or any other museum in the world. In the days of early America, the Founding Fathers held few doubts that man had been created rather than evolved. The Declaration of Independence says plainly, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. The Founding Fathers maintained that the rights and liberties of men were defended by the authority of God who created them. But if mankind merely evolved, then a man's rights are established only by man's opinion. As that opinion changes, 
the rights of men can also change, as was the case in Nazi Germany. Hitler believed that evolution was true and the inferior races need to be eliminated, and he had a list. Hitler's opinion was that Jews and people considered genetically inferior should be eliminated from society. The Nazis relied upon the Darwinian view of the natural selection of favored races to further their own ideas on the struggle for life. In fact, Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, means my struggle, a struggle the Nazis clearly defined as demonstrated by this propaganda film. In the opening scene, the narrator makes direct reference to Darwin's teaching on natural selection. Alles Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. Gesunde Menschen wohnten in engen, lichtlosen Gassen und halb verfallenen Lauben. Idioten und Schwachsinnigen baute man aber Paläste und diese kranken Menschen waren gar nicht empfänglich für die Schönheit, mit der man sie umgab. Das deutsche Volk kennt das ganze Ausmaß dieses Elends wohl kaum. Es kennt nicht den drückenden Geist jener Häuser, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen, die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. In den letzten 70 Jahren hat sich unser Volk um 50 Prozent vermehrt, während die Zahl der Erbkranken im gleichen Zeitraum um 450 Prozent gestiegen ist. Wenn diese Entwicklung so weiterliefe, würde schon in 50 Jahren auf vier gesunde Menschen ein Erbkranker kommen. Ein endloser Zug des Grauens würde in die Nation hineinmarschieren. Maßloses Elend über ein wertvolles Volk kommen, das dann mit Riesenschritten seinem Ende entgegenginge. Die jüdische Bevölkerung Baltis wird in Sammellager gebracht. Das sind jene Ostjudentypen, die besonders nach dem Weltkriege die Großstädte Mittel- und Westeuropas überschwemmten, wo sie als Parasiten ihre Gastvölker zersetzten und tausendjährige Kulturen zu vernichten drohten. Under evolutionary influence, Hitler declared, I have the right to exterminate millions of individuals of inferior races which multiply like vermin. While Germany had been a democratic society, the Nazis evolved German law and changed it to suit their own wicked desires. In the Bible, God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It is for this reason that the principles and teachings of the Bible were considered so important by early Americans. Sir William Blackstone maintained that man-made laws should not be allowed to contradict the laws of God. And if man's laws did contradict God's laws, Blackstone stated they were not valid. In Acts 5.29, the apostles taught, we ought to obey God rather than men. In the Bible, God reveals that because man was made in God's image, he holds a particular place above every creature on earth. Man is not equal to the beasts of the field, but he would be if all life evolved from a common source. If that were the case, killing a man would be no different than killing an insect or a cow or a carrot. This was the thinking that allowed Hitler to murder millions in the Second World War. Exterminating Jews and undesirables was compared to getting rid of rats and insects. Ratten auch auftauchen, tragen sie Vernichtung ins Land, zerstören sie menschliche Güter und Nahrungsmittel. Auf diese Weise verbreiten sie Krankheiten, Pest, Lepra, Typhus, Cholera, Ruhr und so weiter.
Sie sind hinterlistig, feige und grausam und treten meist in großen Scharen auf. Sie stellen unter den Tieren das Element der heimtückischen unterirdischen Zerstörung dar. Nicht anders als die Juden unter den Menschen. This Nazi documentary shows workers using poison gas as a pesticide. Blausäure, die ja äußerst giftig ist, eignet sich zur Schädlingsbekämpfung ganz besonders. Hier ihre einfachste Anwendungsart. Man lässt sie von porösen Gipswürfeln aufsaugen, die dann in gewöhnlichen Blechbüchsen gasdicht verschlossen werden. Within a few years, this same gas would be used to murder Jews at Auschwitz. Heinrich Himmler stated that anti-Semitism is like being deloused. Getting rid of lice is hardly a philosophical issue. It's a matter of cleanliness. Similarly, anti-Semitism is a hygienic measure that we have been forced to endure. While evolution teaches the idea of favored races, the Bible says that God hath made of one blood all nations of men, and that mankind was given dominion over every living thing upon the face of all the earth. The Lord said to Noah, Surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. But if God did not create men, under what authority should a man's person be protected? I've asked evolutionists all over the country, you know, if evolution is true, I have a simple question. How do we tell right from wrong? How does anybody tell right from wrong if evolution is true? A simple fact is you can't tell right from wrong. There's no such thing as right or wrong if evolution is true. Might makes right. Whoever's the strongest, they get their way. You know, the biggest lion gets the zebra. Uh, and that's kind of the way evolution theory ends up. The bottom line is there is no, there's no standard for right and wrong, uh, no moral base whatsoever. And I think the theory is not only dumb, I think it's very dangerous. Shortly after Darwin's theory was published, a man named Christopher Columbus Langdell became dean of Harvard Law School. Langdell believed wholeheartedly in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. He also believed that as man evolved, his laws must also evolve. Langdell introduced the now famous case law method into the American legal system. In his book on the history of American education, author and researcher Vaughn Schatzer writes that case law basically means judges would interpret the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights as they believed it should be interpreted, not necessarily in accordance with the intent of the Founding Fathers. In case law, should the judge or judges not believe in God or the Bible, Christian principles or values would not be used. If judges did not believe abortion was murder, they ruled accordingly. If judges did not believe homosexuality was wrong, they ruled accordingly. Sir William Blackstone's famous commentaries on the law were used for about 160 years by American lawyers, courts, U.S. Senate, and law schools to settle disputes, to define words, and to examine procedure. Thomas Jefferson once stated that the influence of Blackstone's commentaries on law was so strong on American lawyers, they were used with the same dedication and reverence that Muslims use the Koran. But in the 1930s, Blackstone's commentaries that were based on biblical principles were discarded in favor of the evolutionary case law method. The first major decision the courts made using the case law method was in 1962, the removal of prayer from schools. The Supreme Court reached decisions in 1962 and 1963 that declared prayer and the reading of Bible verses in public schools to be unconstitutional. This is ironic when one considers that the American school system was originally established for the purpose of teaching the Bible to all Americans. Perhaps the chief reason every American child learns to read can be traced to an early American law known as the Old Deluder Satan Act, established in 1647. 
The law began with the words, it being one chief object of that old deluder, Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former times. For this reason, the law stated that children must learn to read and write so they would be able to read the Bible for themselves and avoid the errors of the dark ages. Many researchers today consider it of great significance that the 1960s brought an end to an American standard in education that stood for more than 300 years. In the early 60s and the 63, prayer was taken out of our schools. And right then, in, from 1963 on, is when we saw a great rise in sexually transmitted diseases, uh, illegal drug use, uh, all, uh, child abuse, uh, premarital sex, I mean, just all kinds of moral indicators began to fall apart. The world began, America particularly, began to fall apart in the early 1960s morally, I think largely because of the introduction of this evolution theory into our textbooks, which says there's no God, there's no way to determine right from wrong. While biblical teachings on the creation have been removed from schools, the pagan doctrine of evolution has deceptively replaced them. Evolution is perhaps most clearly seen in the Hindu teaching of reincarnation. Dying and living and dying and living, this endless cycle of reincarnation. This is the basis of Hindu Eastern mystical thinking, evolution. That there was death that came into the world. Now God says that he created a perfect world. A perfect world there was no death. According to the Bible, death entered the world through Adam when he sinned with Eve in the garden. Prior to Adam's sin, there was no death. Sin brought in death, and God killed the first possibly lamb. The animal sacrifice, the first animal sacrifice, was committed by God himself, who covered the sinners with a covering for sin. And this was a foreshadowing of what he would do through Jesus Christ, that there would be a death and a blood sacrifice to cover sin. So to say that there was death before life and this endless cycle of reincarnation and evolution, which is synonymous, that the two of them go together, is unbiblical. So here we have in schools today, for instance, a faith that undergirds paganism, heathenism, mystical Eastern thinking, which is evolution, which is now being taught in schools as part of a conditioning process, whereas creationism has been taken out of schools because they say it's religious because it comes from the Bible. So you've got one faith, the faith on how the world began, creationism, taken out of the uh, classroom, because it's not scientific, but you've got another faith that undergirds Eastern mysticism, evolution, being brought into the classroom called a science. But why did evolutionary theory gain such strength and power in a nation founded on biblical principles? And how did so many come to believe that evolution is fact rather than theory? The mainstream offers the following view, which seems typical. Before the 19th century, Western man looked to the Bible for an explanation of his origins. In the story of Genesis, God created man from the dust of the earth 6,000 years ago. But when man dug into the earth for answers, he found evidence that appeared to tell a different story. Evolution. But is this really what happened? Did the physical evidence give man reason to doubt the biblical account? Or did man create a theory and then go looking for some way to prove it. Modern sources, like this documentary hosted by Charlton Heston, have begun to admit that this was indeed the case. When Darwin's theory of evolution was embraced, it was assumed that in the next century enough fossil evidence would be found to prove that man had evolved from the apes. Darwinists have promised us a missing link, and so they've got to deliver. They've got to come up with one. Uh, any missing link will do, it seems. Any missing link will do, it seems. Darwin published his theory in 1859. It was half a century later before any evidence arrived to support it. In 1912, British scientist Charles Dawson made the Piltdown Man discovery and changed the world. Piltdown Man was considered the missing link 
supposedly the skull and jawbone of a half-man, half-ape mutation. It convinced millions that Darwin's theory was scientifically proved. But in 1953, some 40 years later, Piltdown was declared a hoax. It was uh, somebody taking a human skull and an ape's jawbone. They broke off uh, the joint where they would fit together so they couldn't tell, then filed them down, made them look really old, and, and uh, buried them in a gravel pit. But it was a hoax, a deliberate, either a joke, which they never told anybody about for 40 years, or a lie to try to prove the evolution theory. In either case, it may be said that no other discovery in the 20th century has had as great an impact on furthering evolution than Piltdown. Stephen Jay Gould writes that Piltdown absorbed the professional attention of many fine scientists. It led millions of people astray for 40 years. Researcher Richard Harder reports that more than 500 articles and memoirs were written on the Piltdown finds before the hoax was exposed. Likewise, articles in encyclopedias and sections in textbooks and popular books of science, an immense amount of derivative work. For many years, the Piltdown finds were a significant percentage of the fossils which were used to reconstruct human ancestry. In his book, The Piltdown Forgery, J.S. Weiner remarks that this ill-begotten form of primitive man received nearly as much attention as all the legitimate specimens in the fossil record put together. Yet once the hoax was exposed, the scientific community failed to repent of its error. The damage had already been done, and a generation of evolutionary thought had been born. Dawson himself never lived to be exposed. He died shortly after his famous discovery in 1916. While controversy over the hoax continues, today the BBC refers to Dawson as the Piltdown Faker. They write that of his discoveries, at least 38 are fakes. The only suspect in these frauds is Charles Dawson himself, the same man who uncovered the remains of Eanthropus Dawsoni, the Piltdown Man. BBC concludes that for Charles Dawson, Piltdown was not a one-off hoax, more the culmination of a life's work. Yet Dawson did not act alone. His partner in the Piltdown affair was a young paleontologist and Roman Catholic Jesuit priest named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. I tend to believe in a Catholic priest named Pierre de Chardin was involved in this also, and he really pushed evolution on the Catholic Church. Uh, because he said, oh, we got proof, we got this half man, half monkey. After Dawson's death, Teilhard would become heir to the find of the century and may be the man most responsible for the normalization of evolutionary thinking in Western culture today. Teilhard would go on to work in China and take part in the now famous Peking Man discovery, a collection of would-be missing links that mysteriously disappeared in 1941 before anyone could fully examine them. Of 175 fossil fragments recorded, all were supposedly lost. Only the notes and photographs taken by Teilhard and his team of scientists remain. Modern critics question the integrity of the find because of Teilhard's association with Charles Dawson, the Piltdown faker. But Teilhard's scientific deceptions are minor when compared to the theological abyss that he sought to drag himself and humanity into. He wrote, is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is the general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow, and which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines must follow. Treated as an apostate by the Vatican, banned from teaching, and forbidden to publish his writings, Teilhard became the hero of sophisticated Protestants and then returned to the good graces of Rome 26 years after his death. The Catholic Church, that once rejected evolutionary thinking, seems to have been among those who bowed to its hypothesis, largely due to the influence of Teilhard, who had become a hero and role model for a whole generation of younger priests and theologians. He set the stage for the renewal movements 
which finally came to flower in the era of Vatican II. Vatican II is the Catholic document that launched the ecumenical movement for the purpose of ultimately unifying mankind in a universal faith. Evolution plays a key role in ecumenism since the pagan religions of the world are largely based on its precepts. Under Pope John Paul II, Rome now considers evolution to be a part of the gospel truth. It is reported that the Pope has put the teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church firmly behind the view that the human body is the product of a gradual process of evolution. But the influence of this Jesuit priest would reach far beyond the walls of Rome. In 1985, author Marilyn Ferguson published her controversial book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, which USA Today called the Handbook of the New Age. In it, Ferguson describes a worldwide conspiracy of people seeking to bring about a paradigm shift in global consciousness. In the Los Angeles Times, Marilyn Ferguson revealed that Teilhard was the name most frequently mentioned by 185 leaders in the New Age movement when Ferguson asked who was the most influential person in their lives. By the end of the 20th century, Teilhard du Chardin would be known by many as the father of the New Age. Teilhard died in 1955, but his passing only marked the beginning of his meteoric rise to fame. His treatises, long suppressed, were published and quickly translated into all major languages. Harvard's Widener Library now houses an entire tier of books devoted to Teilhard's writing and thinking. Today, more and more people, Christians as well as non-Christians, accept his views and take keen interest in studying his philosophy. He has become known for his theory that man is evolving mentally and socially toward a final spiritual unity. Andrew Jackson Davis, known by some as the prophet of the new revelation, channeled a message from the spirit realm that called for the paleontological sciences to direct man's perception of God through the study of nature. Is it merely coincidence that Teilhard du Chardin, a priest and paleontologist, would lead the way into the dawn of a new age? Researcher Charles P. Henderson writes, this paleontologist and Jesuit priest made it his personal mission to reconstruct the most basic Christian doctrines from the perspectives of science. He would do this by overthrowing all the barriers that had been erected between science and religion. He would take the lessons learned from the study of nature as the foundation on which to reconstruct the Christian faith. After the similar examples of Swedenborg, Phineas Quimby, and Mary Baker Eddy, Teilhard sought to deny the reality of sin and openly rejected the biblical gospel. In 1947, Teilhard said, very definitely there was no Adam and no Eve and no original sin. He wrote that original sin continually obstructs the natural expansion of our religion. It is a straitjacket that checks any movement of heart or head. It binds us hand and foot and drains the blood from us because it represents a survival of static concepts that are an anachronism in our evolutionist system of thought. A Catholic newsletter says that in the theology of Teilhard, we are all becoming Christ. There is no original sin and therefore no need of redemption. Evolutionary forces are ferrying everyone along to Godhood and all are anonymous Christians making faith in the literal death and resurrection of Christ unnecessary. The American Atheist magazine understands the situation too well. It writes, destroy Adam and Eve and original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God and take away the meaning of his death. But did Tear intend to undermine the Christ of the Bible? Some have thought so since Tear's evolutionary teachings parallel Eastern mysticism and pagan theology. The whole Eastern pagan theological worldview is to undermine the deity of Christ and to elevate the deity of humanity. So Eastern mysticism, paganism, 
is talking about the God within. The way they Christianize it is by saying Christ is within me. I am the Christ or the Antichrist that's going to come is the Christ or the Lord, the Maitreya. So all of it is actually lessening the work of Christ and man is elevated to a Christ-like person. And you'll find that in most of the cults, they will not give, Christ is not given the position of deity. Another researcher writes that Roman Catholic scholar Pierre Teilhard du Chardin taught that the God to be worshipped is the one who will arise out of the evolving human race. Surely man's desire echoes Lucifer's proud boast. The book of Isaiah says of him, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will. You know, this guy's an egomaniac, a self-deceived egomaniac. I think he really thinks he's going to win the battle with God. Anyway, he said, I will be like the Most High. I mean, you got to be really deluded even to say that. That's the impossible dream. How many Most Highs can there be? I mean, you can't have. That's why God is called the Most High God. Okay? Now, there are a lot of other pretender gods. But he says to them, Jeremiah 10, verses 10 and 11, I'm the true God that created this universe. You say to the gods who have not made this heaven and earth. They will perish from under this heaven and from this earth. So in that one ambition, I will be like the Most High, Lucifer did away with monotheism, one true God, introduced, he introduced polytheism. <laughs> there will be many gods. Well, I'll be one of them. <laughs> in fact, he's going to be the supreme one. Lucifer's desire to be like the Most High God has compelled him to counterfeit the things of God. It is for this reason that so many similarities exist between the pagan religions of the world and Christianity. The Virgin Mother Goddess cult is perhaps the greatest example of this. Bible scholars believe that God's promise in the Garden of Eden concerning the seed of the woman, as opposed to the seed of the man, is the earliest reference to the virgin birth. It is for this reason that we find so many counterfeit virgin mothers in the pagan religions. Mothers that look very similar to the paintings of the Virgin Mary, holding their sons who are often called deliverers. In paganism, one of the titles given to the mother goddess figures is the Queen of Heaven, a title that Rome has also given to the Catholic Virgin Mary. But in the Bible, Mary was never called a queen and nobody ever prayed to her. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, God specifically condemns prayers and offerings to the so-called Queen of Heaven. This confusion has caused some New Agers to suggest that Christianity is based upon pagan doctrines. New Age writer David Icke writes that Jesus was born to a virgin, but so was Krishna, Buddha, Lao Tse, Confucius, Horus, Ra, Zoroaster, Prometheus, Perseus, Apollo, Mercury, Baldur, Quetzalcoatl, and far too many others to mention. But what Ike and New Agers fail to realize is that Satan has for centuries been counterfeiting the promise of God concerning a deliverer, something that God promised in the Garden of Eden when he spoke of the seed of the woman that would bruise the head of the serpent. Just as God laid the foundation for the Messiah through the prophecies of the scripture and fulfilled them in Jesus Christ, so Satan has prepared the world through the ancient mystery religions for the coming of Antichrist. The Greek prefix anti holds two meanings. It means against, but it also means another or in the place of. Therefore, Antichrist is literally another Christ. Teilhard du Chardin, who is known as one of the most frequently quoted writers by leading New Age occultists, defines perhaps better than any the Antichrist prophesied throughout the New Age movement. Teilhard said, quote, I believe that the Messiah whom we await, whom we all without any doubt await, is the universal Christ. That is to say, the Christ of evolution. 
Teilhard said, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who fundamentally satisfies them all. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. Teilhard's views have been warmly welcomed by Pope John Paul II, who praised the wonderful repercussions of his research and investigations. The Pope has furthered Teilhard's vision through the ecumenical movement. The Pope is the leader of an ecumenical movement like this world has never seen. He gathered 160 leaders of the world's 12 major religions there in Assisi. Who was there? Snake worshippers, literally, some snake worshippers. Fire worshippers, spiritists, animists, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, North American Indian witch doctors, their paint and feathers, fetishes and rattles, walking to the microphone, you know, uh, to pray for peace. Uh, and he said, we're all praying to the same God. Our prayers are creating a spiritual energy, bringing about a new climate for peace. So uh, there is an ecumenical movement. Uh, it won't just be the Catholics. I mean, you can see they're all joining the Catholic Church the ecclesial head of, of the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He says, oh, we gotta come back under the Pope. Robert Schuller says, what do we have to do to say to the, the shepherd, how do we come home, you know? Uh, they're all talking about, we've got to acknowledge the leadership of the Pope. So you, you have this ecumenical movement and all of them will join under Rome. The ecumenical movement has compelled Pope John Paul II to put on the garments of paganism in more ways than one. The Pope kissed the Muslim Quran, a book that vehemently denies Jesus as the Son of God. He allowed his friend, the Dalai Lama, to replace the cross with a statue of Buddha on the altar of St. Peter's Church in Assisi, and for the Dalai Lama and his monks to perform their Buddhist worship there. The Pope even received the mark of Shiva on his forehead. Shiva is the Hindu god who is called the Lord of Death. Disturbing to some researchers is the fact that according to the Satanic Bible, Shiva is a synonym for Satan. The drive to establish a universal religion has influenced some of the highest levels of the Protestant churches as well. Two great supporters of Pope John Paul are Robert Schuller, who made a special trip to Rome to ask the Pope's blessing on the building plans for his crystal cathedral, and the Reverend Billy Graham, who has called the Pope the greatest religious leader of the modern world and one of the greatest moral and spiritual leaders of the century. Together, Schuller and Graham, who influence millions of people around the world, seem to openly support the Pope's ecumenical movement. Listen now and judge in yourself whether the Christ they preach is the Christ of the Bible or the universal Christ of the New Age. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? Well, Christianity and being a true believer, you know, I think there's the, the, the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping uh, revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James, in the first council in Jerusalem, when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world, uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. And I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be who go in that way. Because straight is the gate and narrow the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it.
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The New Age concept is that the many Christs of paganism somehow equal a single universal Christ. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He said, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. The Bible confirms that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus warned that there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, but the Lord says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. When the Lord returns, he will settle the conflict over who is the real Christ. The Bible says that at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The scripture says that God has exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The person and character of Jesus is at the very heart of the gospel message. Jesus said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Satan knows this, and through the New Age movement, has taught millions to trust in another Jesus and another Christ, Antichrist. The Apostle John writes, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, by which we know that it is the last time. Antichrist will be the manifestation of Satan's desire to exalt himself above God. The Bible says that Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. Most researchers believe that the New Age movement, combined with the New World Order, will ultimately unite the world to serve and worship this man of sin. Many researchers believe that the time of Antichrist's appearing is nearer now than ever before, especially since the United Nations has launched a global effort to establish a one-world religion, as revealed by this CBN report. Many liberal organizations, including the United Nations, are pursuing the development of a one-world religious organization. Today, on the United Nations 55th anniversary, CBN News reporter Wendy Griffith takes a look at what's behind this push for a global religious voice. After a while, the drums, chants, and prayers representing many of the world's leading religions all started to sound alike, somehow losing their flavor in a melting pot of spiritual soup. The first ever Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious and Spiritual Leaders took place at the United Nations in August, and some believe it marked the first major step toward a movement to usher in a global spiritual body that may one day speak for all religions. Robert McGinnis with the Family Research Council says it appears the hidden agenda is to unite people under one religious organization 
so they will peacefully accept UN goals such as population control, abortion rights, and one world government. Instead of all these different gods, maybe there's one god who manifests himself and revealed himself in different ways to different people. You know, what about that, huh? CNN founder and billionaire Ted Turner was the honorary chair of the World Religion Summit. Turner, known for his critical views on biblical Christianity, promoted the New Age concept that there are many ways to heaven. The thing that disturbed me is that uh, my religious Christian sect uh, was very intolerant, not intolerant of religious freedom for other people, but uh, we thought we were the, they thought that we were the only ones going to heaven. Supporters of a global religious voice have come down hard on evangelical Christians who refuse to adopt their New Age agenda. Although the URI says it is not a religion, critics say it does preach a theology, a theology that teaches acceptance and diversity among all faiths. Those who push for a global religious organization believe that all religions, while different on the surface, are each valid pathways to God. The United Nations is a very interesting and complex body of networking, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of New Age groups that are networked together, the political activists that want to bring in um, merging of spiritual ideas. And we're warned in the Bible that what's going to happen in order for the world to elevate this one person who's going to be a world leader our spiritual ideas have to merge to lift up this person who is going to get mankind to believe that he is the Christ, that he is the world leader. And the United Nations is uh, a, a part of that conditioning process. The whole point of unifying spiritually is to globalize a sort of one world religion, to have the idea that through a united mind, through a like-minded mind consciousness, mankind can evolve to God consciousness. But what is the influence for this mind consciousness, this united mind that will bring the world together? The Bible foretells of ten kings that will one day rule the world, saying that these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Researchers argue that the chief influence behind the United Nations is an organization known as the Theosophical Society, considered by some to be the most powerful occult organization in the modern world. The Theosophical Society has had more influence on the United Nations than any other religious society, whether you would call it Christian or occult. The House of Theosophy, as it is called, was founded by a woman known as Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky was a mystic, and she had truly supernatural power. She had a tremendous impact on people, and was able to recruit many of the world's leading people into her organization, people like Arthur Colan Doyle, who wrote the, uh, the great stories about uh, Sherlock Holmes, Thomas Edison. Uh, was one of her disciples, as was William Stead, who was uh, one of the dis three, four original members of the secret society Cecil Rhodes created, which became the Council on Foreign Relations. Many key people, you know, in the 19th century joined Theosophy, as in the 20th century, Margaret Sanger and Adolf Hitler uh, were disciples of Theosophy, uh, uh, as uh, are people uh, like. Um, um, of Robert Mueller who for many years was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations because the major driving force behind the idea of the United Nations and world government is the occult. In 1888, Blavatsky published her now famous work, The Secret Doctrine, a book revered by occult practitioners all over the world. Adolf Hitler reportedly slept with a copy of this book at his bedside. Blavatsky subtitled the work, The Synthesis of Science, Religion, and Philosophy. The secret doctrine is filled with ancient mystery wisdom that more than a century later continues to hold New Age readers spellbound. There's no way that it will girl uh, with a sixth or seventh grade education could possibly have written this. Uh, these 
volumes were channeled to her by uh, a demonic spirit she called Kut Humi. And uh, she actually traveled to um, Tibet, uh, to India, and she claims that she actually went to Tibet and actually met her master there. Kut Humi is the name given to a Tibetan spirit master who was Blavatsky's teacher in her lifetime. Blavatsky is pictured here with some of the masters or spirit beings she communed with and admired, Kut Humi, El Moria, and Saint Germain. Under the mysterious orders of such spirits, Blavatsky's mission was to bring a philosophical understanding to unexplained phenomena, such as the mysterious wrappings and other spirit communication that had been occurring in the West. Blavatsky maintained that spiritualistic phenomena without the philosophy of occultism were dangerous and misleading. For this apparent reason, the spirit beings directly commanded Blavatsky to begin the Theosophical Society. The official website of the society in Adyar, India, says that the Theosophical Society may be said to have begun when H.P. Blavatsky, under orders of the Masters, returned from India in 1871 to found an organization through which the West and the world in general would be instructed in true spirituality. The official birthday of the society came four years later in 1875 with a formal declaration from Henry S. Alcott, the president and co-founder of the organization. Blavatsky's House of Theosophy would formalize what began as the New Thought Movement into a religious system that would dramatically change the Western view of God and his relationship to mankind. While early America recognized the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only path to salvation, theosophical teachings argued for the essential oneness of all religions and the omnipresence of divine spirit. Theosophy declares that it was formed upon the basis of a universal brotherhood of humanity. Yet Blavatsky would teach far more than a universal brotherhood. She would take the New Thought movement to the next dimension, fully exposing the source of its power in her voluminous writings. These volumes were channeled to her. And uh, they're very, very complex, they're very erudite, uh, but if you read them, you'll find out uh, that she has rejected the God of the Bible and embraced Lucifer. And she's quite open about that. She did uh, emphasize Satan as being the true God and, and Satan beckoning Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit. She was really he was really turning them on to true Godhood, and he's the one who really freed the human race in Blavatsky's teaching. According to Blavatsky, Satan was in fact God, while Jehovah, the God of the Bible, was the real devil and enemy of mankind. Blavatsky wrote that the appellation Satan belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all other gods, Jehovah, not to the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. Elsewhere, she writes that Satan, the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind, for it is he who opened the eyes of the automaton, Adam, created by Jehovah. In the secret doctrine, she says, in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferus is the name of the angelic entity presiding over the light of truth as over the light of the day. Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. And now it stands proven, she says, that Satan, or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus, and Lucifer, or light bearer, is in us. It is our mind, our tempter and redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior from pure animalism and her demons that channeled her writings to her. Uh, and uh, of course she wrote about world government, the importance of world government, and uh, the idea that, that mankind, at least Western civilization, began with the Aryan, and the Aryan came out of Tibet. 
And of course, if you've ever read anything about Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler, why they actually sent expeditions to Tibet looking for the origins of Aryan man. And there were strong ties between the SS and this whole idea of this, uh, this uh, Superman that they were trying to create and the writings of Madame Blavatsky. The entire basis of, of the Nazi movement was founded on theosophy and her writings. And of course, the symbol that she used, the swastika, is what Adolf Hitler uh, used as the symbol of the Nazi movement. But the average individual does not understand the relationships between Madame Blavatsky's writing and her worship of Lucifer and her accessing the other dimensions and what happened in Germany under Adolf Hitler. Time magazine did a whole thing on the New Age movement with uh, you know, with crystals and, you know, talking about all the different New Age phenomena that became very popular in the 80s and is still with us to, to this day. And Shirley MacLaine was on the front cover holding the crystals. And, and uh, in that piece, they talked about, uh, in the introduction of that piece at the beginning of the magazine, they talked about how we don't know where the term New Age came from or where it's going. Well, the Bible tells us, Jesus said in the last days there would be this false, you know, this religious movement which would be saying the time draws near, which would be predicting a new age, uh, and would, which would have its basis in satanic or false miracles, which is what the New Age movement's all about. Uh, so we know where it's going. In 1904, a man named Aleister Crowley channeled a spirit who inspired a series of writings known as the Book of the Law. According to the introduction of the work, the book was dictated in Cairo, Egypt, between noon and 1 p.m. on three successive days. The author, a demonic spirit, called himself Iwas and claimed to be a messenger from the forces ruling this earth at present. This description is quite revealing since Jesus referred to Satan as the prince or ruler of this world. Satan is also called the God of this world by the Apostle Paul. In this book of the law, Crowley set down the chief principle for what he called the new eon. He wrote, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. There is no law beyond do what thou wilt. This declaration is in contrast to the example of Christ in the Bible. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, not as I will, but as thou wilt, in obedience to God. But in the book of the law, Crowley turns the tables and teaches men, not as God wills, but rather, do what thou wilt. This promotion of self-will that so often leads to self-empowerment is perhaps the climax of man's desire to be his own God, to rule over himself rather than live in obedience to the God who created him. Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Having thoroughly rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, Aleister Crowley would earn the title of the wickedest man in the world by the London newspapers. The British media exposed his bizarre satanic rituals at the mysterious Abbey Thelema in Sicily. On one occasion, a man named Raoul Loveday died from drinking poisoned cat's blood at Crowley's command. Loveday's widow returned to London and exposed Crowley's wicked behavior to the world. When he was a child, Crowley's own mother referred to him as the Beast. According to Crowley researcher James W. Rivak, he quickly identified with the title, and for the rest of his life, he viewed himself as the Beast of the Apocalypse, the enemy of Christianity. Like all New Age adherents, past and present, Crowley revered the serpent's lie from the Garden of Eden. He wrote, This serpent, Satan, is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. He bade know thyself and taught initiation. Through the 20th century, the influence of this black magician and professing Satanist upon popular culture has compelled some researchers to consider him the real father of the modern New Age movement. Well, he's basically uh, not only the father of modern Satanism, and the most highly regarded Satanist of the last century. Uh, he is also uh, the father of the modern New Age movement, uh, which is 
extensive around the Western world today. Uh, I won't say he single-handedly ushered in the New Age movement, but he, more so than any other human being, was instrumental in the popularization of the New Age movement. Altered states of consciousness, trying to make uh, altered states of consciousness scientific, uh, through whether it be hallucinogens and, and seeing reality different, and using the comparisons of a microscope and uh, and a you know looking into a different reality on a spiritual level, uh, whether it was drugs, whether it was astrology, or the practice of ritual magic, whether it was uh, sex magic, whether it was his uh, ideas of world unity uh, through magic and so forth. Uh, all these are very popular through the 1960s and after that in ushering in uh, what today is called the New Age Movement. But he was very, very powerful as far as, I mean, more so than anybody. Uh, Satanists will admit that Lester Crowley was, uh, you know, the Satanist of the 20th century. Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, which was more notorious than Lester Crowley's uh, group, uh, was simply pop Satanism to many serious Satanists. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Shem Ham Farash! Shem Ham Farash! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! And even Anton LaVey's group, I mean, Anton LaVey's uh, library was chock full of Aleister Crowley's books. Uh, the co-founder of the Church of Satan with Anton LaVey, Kenneth Anger, was an avowed Satanist who was a follower of Aleister Crowley. And many of his works, Invocation to My Demon Brother, a Lucifer Rising, and so forth, videos that he made in the late 60s extolling Satanism were all about Aleister Crowley unveiling a, you know, a picture of Crowley and that's worshipped and so forth. Uh, so, uh, in, in regard to Satanism, uh, his name comes up over and over again in Satanic music and so forth. But even more importantly, in regard to the New Age movement, in the early 1900s, Aleister Crowley was talking about the New Eon. Ionis is a Greek word for age, and the new eon being the new age. And what's interesting about Crowley's uh, emphasis on the new age, it had everything to do with what became popular in the 1960s. In his shocking 10-hour documentary, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, Pastor Joe Schimmel exposes the role of music in furthering the new age through the 1960s counterculture movement and reveals Aleister Crowley as the patron saint of rock musicians. I can't think of any other occultist who's been more influential on rock musicians than Aleister Crowley, no one close. Uh, London Times called Crowley the unsung hero of the 1960s. In fact, uh, if you look at the 1960s counterculture leaders, John Lennon, he said his whole philosophy was, and he quoting Aleister Crowley's axiom, do what thou wilt, was the whole Beatles philosophy, he said, in his interviews before his death, what death was do what thou wilt. And they put their heroes up on Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band album, and who did they place there? Uh, Lester Crowley. Uh, in fact, that whole album, as we show in our uh, rockumentary, was basically a tribute to Crowley's new eon, along with their Satanic Majesty's Request by the Stones that the Beatles put out with Sgt. Pepper. In fact, we make a really clear case for Sgt. Pepper uh, being Crowley. In fact, Crowley died 20 years before that album came out, and of course the song 20 years ago today, Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. <laughs> It's quite interesting because not only was Lennon and the Beatles into a Lester Crowley, but we show the Rolling Stones and how they were into Crowley and Mick Jagger and Keith Richards helping out with even Kenneth Anger's movies uh, pushing a Lester Crowley's Satanism in uh, Lucifer Rising and so forth. So you have the Stones, you have the Beatles, the two biggest rock bands in the 1960s. Uh, you have Jim Morrison with a bust of Aleister Crowley, the biggest American rock idol of the 60s on his album 13. We go on and on. Uh, Led Zeppelin, the biggest band of the 1970s. Jimmy Page buying Aleister Crowley's uh, mansion overlooking Loch Ness, being full on to, into Aleister Crowley, and using implements of his temple on the Presence album on the front cover, uh, uh, as Crowley uh, talked about in his books on ritual magic, and uh, even down to his symbol, Zoso, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, which is really soul, and spelled forward and soul spelled backwards of the solar god. Soul was S-O-L, the god of, or Satan, in, uh, in Crowley's books. It was another symbol of Satan, S-O-L. And that was uh, Jimmy Page's occult symbol 
uh, that he used that nobody could decipher. Uh, and recently in Rolling Stone magazine interview in that, or 2002, they all came out and said what their symbol meant, except Page still wouldn't come out and say what his meant. But Crowley said to write backwards and forward. If you look at that symbol closely, it's soul forward and backwards. Uh, so that's still not known to even the rock world what that symbol was, but Jimmy Page has admitted being an admirer of Crowley, practicing Crowley's magic uh, to for power and so forth, and they became very powerful. Uh, these bands uh, sold their soul for rock and roll, so to speak. song performed by Crowley disciple Ozzy Osbourne is said to reveal perhaps the darkest side of the new age. In the latter half of the song, listen as Osbourne calls upon Crowley, known as the Great Beast, to ride his white horse. Schimmel and others believe this to be symbolic of the coming Antichrist, known as the first horseman of the apocalypse. In the book of Revelation we read, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. In his writings, a Lester Crowley would refer to Antichrist as the crowned and conquering child, the Lord of the Eon. Standing with their backs to the wall is a key phrase in this song. Some researchers believe it denotes the mass murder of those who refuse to worship the New Age Christ. Standing with their backs to the wall, awaiting execution. And ultimately that's where all this is leading. I mean, it's all about peace and love on the outside. But when it all comes down, there's going to be a brutal leader that will emerge who Crowley uh, was forthright enough to talk about in his in his books and talk about this bloodbath that would come when Christians would be put to death in the establishment of the New World Order. But is this merely the radical view of a drug-crazed Satanist like Aleister Crowley? Or is there, as many suggest, a global effort at work? We remind the viewer that the 20th century is without question the bloodiest in man's history. Some 170 million lives were lost to Nazism, Communism, and the various killing fields of the world because of the darkness in the hearts of men. The Bible warns that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, including murder. Next, we turn to the town of Elberton, Georgia, the granite capital of the world. Elberton is famous for its production of tombstones, exporting some 250,000 tombstones every year. Oddly enough, the town that makes a living through death is also the home of what some consider the most threatening monument in America. A monument that some believe is a symbol for the coming Holocaust, promoting a depopulation effort at a massive scale. It was back in 1979 when a stranger came to Elberton, Georgia. Now, Elberton, Georgia is on the eastern part of Georgia, very close to the South Carolina border. And uh, this stranger said that uh, he was part of a secret group and they wanted to build a great 
granite monument. This was done by a guy, you have a pseudonym, came in, paid cash, had this company set these things up in 1980, called himself R.C. Christian, uh, but that's not his real name. It says it right on the stones, a pseudonym. Nobody knows his real name because that isn't his real name. Nobody knows uh, who put the money up other than this fictional individual. Nobody knows what secret group he represents. Of course, Elberton uh, mines granite. They make tombstones there. Uh, and they had the facilities to mine the granite. But he gave very, very specific directions as to how this was to be built so that it would always be aligned in certain ways, so you'd always be able to see the North Star, so it would be aligned with the moon and, and with the various phases of the sun. And uh, very, very similar to the Stonehenge that they have in England, uh, so the Stonehenge was the Druidic monument. This was to be the American Stonehenge, or it's known as the Georgia Guidestones. And uh, on each one of the Guidestones is, is this message in a different language, actually eight different languages, uh, are the Ten Commandments that come from the dark side. And the first one is maintain uh, the world population at 500 million in constant balance with nature, which doesn't sound too bad until you realize that we've got over 6 billion people in the world. And if we're going to maintain the world population at 500 million in constant balance with nature, we're going to have to kill off about 90% or more of the world's population. I went there and looked at those things and said, now, hold on a minute. Today's population is 6 billion. They want to maintain humanity under one half billion. Looks like a lot of people got to die for their plan to work, which is, by the way, the plan. As Jacques Cousteau said, we'd have to eliminate 350,000 people a day. A third of a million people a day would have to be eliminated to save Mother Earth. Now, Bill Clinton said we need to reduce the population of the Earth to one billion. There are a lot of folks who would like to reduce the population of the Earth. Aleister Crowley taught that a global massacre would be necessary to bring about the new age. He wrote, there is a magical operation of maximum importance, the initiation of a new eon. When it becomes necessary to utter a word, the whole planet must be bathed in blood. Before man is ready to accept the law of Thelema, or will, the great war must be fought. This bloody sacrifice is the critical point of the world ceremony of the crowned and conquering child as Lord of the Eon. This initiation takes place to remove Christians who are considered the primary obstacle to world unity under Antichrist. A magazine called the Omega Letter says that there is only one obstacle to world unity, Christianity. It goes on to say that Christianity claims supernatural knowledge and divine revelation and therefore should not be tolerated. Gus Hall, the former leader of the Communist Party in America said, I dream of a time when the last congressman is strangled to death on the guts of the last preacher. And since the Christians love to sing about the blood, why not give them a little of it? A New Age group calling itself Solar Questers writes, these are wondrous times because the world has gone through this terrific experience as it spins slowly back to its rightful orbit in the position that it should be in the heavens. And as this happens more and more, more comfort and well-being will come upon this world and those who hinder will be removed, liquidated. They must be wiped clean off the face of the earth. Ruth Montgomery, sometimes referred to as the Herald of the New Age said, millions will survive and millions won't. Those who won't will go into the spirit state because there is truly no death. The authors of a New Age pamphlet titled Cosmic Countdown claim to have received messages from a higher intelligence. The pamphlet says the world should be forewarned to be on the lookout for the decimation of populations. These peoples will eventually be replaced by the new root race about to make its appearance in a newly cleansed world. But perhaps the most disturbing comments come from New Age author Barbara Marks Hubbard. Researchers John Ankerberg and John Weldon report that due to her vast financial wealth and influence among leading world politicians and industrialists, she is having a major impact behind the scenes. She has been influenced by spirits for almost two decades. In her book titled Happy Birthday Planet Earth, Hubbard wrote, the choice is, do you wish to become a natural Christ, a universal human, 
or do you wish to die? People will either change or die, she says. That is the choice. Hubbard says, there have always been defective seeds. In the past, they were permitted to die a natural death. We, the elders, have been patiently waiting to take action to cut out this corrupted and corrupting element in the body of humanity. Hubbard's spirit guides gave her a vision of things to come. They told her that out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend, one-fourth is destructive, and they are defective seeds. Now as we approach the quantum shift from the creature human to the co-creative human, the human who is the inheritor of God-like power, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. Jesus said, Yea, the time cometh, that whosoever kills you will think that he does God a service. And these things they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. But if all these things are so, what is a person to do? We ask that question of Pastor Joe Schimmel, Senior Pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel, in Simi Valley, California. Jesus said, he that's not with me is against me. So you could be in the New World Order side, you know, a black magician or a Satanist or somebody that's just caught up in that lie and you're not for Christ, you're against him. But you could also be someone who's fighting against the New World Order and think you're doing good, but refuses to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Refuses to uh, respond to the gospel and repent of your sins and turn to Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're into the same condemnation and the same judgment as the Antichrist in the New World Order. And sadly, there's many people today that see what's going on to a degree, only part of the puzzle, yet they're in, in as much rebellion against God as many of these people that are in the New World Order. And my hope and my prayer is that people that see what's going on uh, would not play into Satan's hands. Because what's going to happen in the end is there's going to be many people fighting against the New World Order. And they're going to think they're going to be doing good. And Satan, I believe, in the end time is going to use that as newsreel clips for see what the Christians are doing, these crazy, these crazy people. And, uh, and Satan is going to use that actually against Christians in the very end. So we true Christians that know Christ need to submit to the scripture, need to realize that if God calls us to die as martyrs, we need to die as martyrs. If God calls us to escape with our families in the mountains, we need to do that. But one thing we need to make sure we don't do is we don't want to make sure we're not the ones trying to blow up the Pentagon or, you know, blow up the United Nations because then what we end up doing is playing right into Satan's hands. So my heart and my hope and my prayer for anybody listening, especially if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, is that you'd recognize that you're a sinner, man. You've fallen short of God's glory. I'm sure you've lied sometime in your life. I'm sure you dishonored your mom or your dad at some time in your life. I'm sure that you used God's name in vain. I'm sure you took something that didn't belong to yours at some time. The Bible says all have sinned. You're a sinner. You're doomed. You're under God's condemnation because of your rebellion. But God loved you, the Bible says. And he sent his son to pay the penalty you deserve, to die in your place. And he paid that penalty. And the scriptures say that if you receive Jesus Christ into your life, the Bible says as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody let me in, I'll come into him and fellowship with him and he with me. So the Bible says you can have eternal life. The Bible says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right now, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and cry out to him and say, Save me, I believe that you died for me, you'll be saved. It doesn't matter what man will do to you. It doesn't matter what the new world order does to you. Uh, the lion can swallow the body, but he can't swallow your soul. And Jesus, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the Bible says if you confess, as Jesus said, me before men, I'll confess you before the Father and the angels in heaven. However, we deny him before man, he'll deny you before the Father in heaven. So let's confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's truly follow him for the heart. Let's dig into our Bibles. Let's follow him the Bible way. And that's uh, my advice is turn to the scripture and turn to Jesus. In his second epistle, the apostle Peter wrote, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? You therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>